Who come on here? Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on Towards Climate Resilient Africa Through the Green and Blue Economies. We are very pleased to invite you to this session, um, which is being co organized by the Stockholm Environment Institute, the UNEP DTU partnership, and with the African Union Commission as co organizer. Welcome to this event. I am pleased to invite Her Excellency Commissioner Josefa Sacco, Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Environment at the African Union Commission to deliver her opening remarks. Excellency. Good afternoon, every one of you. Oh, it's okay. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol duly observed, I'm pleased to welcome you to this side event on building a climate resilient Africa through green and blue economies, and thank the Stockholm Envirom Environment Institute and UNEP for organizing this important conversation with uh, a, a touch upon technology, sustainable job creation, and many important topics that we are going to interact this afternoon. Over the last few days, we have discussed extensively about the urgent needs for the world's major polluters to rein in their emissions in order to give the chance to vulnerable countries to survive. The twin challenge of COVID-19 and uh, climate change have highlighted the extreme inequality which exists across and within the region and shows us that we urgently need to tackle the economic, social, and uh, uh, social health and environmental dimension of development as a package, as an integrated program. The green and blue economy underpins the meaningful technology that will be key to this. Sorry, my, my papers are... Africa, is it coming? Okay. <laughs> Africa is the continent with, with the lowest emission. We have only 4%. Lowest emission yet is stand to be particularly hard hit. As the sixth report of the IPCC has made has made it very, very clear. That is a scientific-based information report, and we need to take it very seriously. That's an indicator that COP26 uh, uh, cannot just be a, a place where we come and do tourism. It has to be a place where we are here for key action, because our government, even the civil society, even the private sector, they invest a lot in this type of journey, this type of converse, and we want really concrete things. Because we've been on it since uh, the Paris Agreement, COP, uh, uh, COP21, up to now, nothing concrete. This part of the world, this region, which is Africa, is seen apart, you know, from our partners, mostly the developed uh, world. So we really need action, concrete action, so that we can mitigate the impact of this called climate change. That's the reason all the world, the planet is here in different, in different side events, but we are all here to bring, to call the attention for those that are responsible to, you know, to increase their ambition and give a better, a better world for our children, for the next generation, for ourselves. We are still very much on the business, so that is very, very important. Furthermore, it is uh, its adaptation needs in terms of, because in Africa, what we want is really adaptation. And to go through adaptation in, 
it needs a lot of investment in terms of funding, and we need also technology, because there are new technology, new seeds. If we look at agriculture, we need new seeds that are resilient and resistant to all these impacts and effects of uh, climate change. And uh, we must remember that energy is the, is, uh, is the most, uh, is as much as, as a, develop, a development issue as it is in climate change issue in Africa. We also need to have a clean energy, the way uh, the European partners are really going to, by 2050, they want to be carbon neutral uh, uh, economy. We want to be there, but we really want to be given a time for us to invest and really change this transition. We are ready to cooperate with all the, uh, all the region but we need time for us to invest properly and adapt the new uh, renewable energy. Uh, so let me also share with you that uh, most, uh, where only 31% 30, of the population in Africa benefits from electrification, and if today we are talking about digitalization, modern agriculture, you know, in the rural area, we still need to really tackle the issue of energy. Electrification, mostly rural electrification for us is key, you know, in this transition that we are going through. We are not saying that urban areas do not, do not have this problem. We have a lot of African countries where even in the capital, in the urban, they still have challenges with energy. So it is very important because we have only access to energy, only 31% 30, of the global population in Africa. We are still very far from reaching our aspiration of producing 300 uh, gigawatts of energy by 2030. This is according to the SDGs uh, uh, goal, but we are very far in Africa. So we need to speed. Those are the areas, that concrete areas that we can get support from our, uh, our region can get support from our partners so that we can also be on the same page and the same, the same level of development as the Europe and the America and the other regions are doing. We, 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 if we look at, uh, at Asia, they are doing very well because they have all these facilities. Africa also needs really proper investment in these areas, which is very important. In the same vein, Africa consumes at least 25% uh, of the world vaccine supply. Yet, 99% of the vaccine are imported. I think we have scientists in, in, on the continent that can also produce vaccine. I am a commissioner for agriculture, rural development, uh, 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 blue economy, as well as sustainable environment. And under my department, we have the vet, uh, vet, uh, vet uh, uh, laboratory that we can we can produce vaccine because the Rwanda pest in the, uh, in the uh, livestock, it was in this, this, uh, this department that eradicated the Rwanda pest in the livestock. So if you can eradicate Rwanda pest, uh, all the other poultry, the, the SARS, we did it in uh, Panvac, it is in Debra Z in uh, Addis Ababa. I think we can also, with our scientists, produce vaccine and assist our, uh, our populations. Central to both uh, the climate and COVID challenges is the fact that uh, the adequate resources must be put in place for Africa to meaningfully tackle, tackle them to, the, to ensure a just transition, as I said. If we don't have any investment, we will not go anywhere, and we will just be turning around, turning around without doing anything. And you know that, uh, we all know that uh, our population is increasing, so demand for food is high. And if we don't have all these facility, technologies, energy, we are not going nowhere, we are not going to combat anger, we are not going to tackle the issues of climate change. So it is very important that uh, we are giving support. It is particularly relevant that today, even we we'll talk about uh, the technological needs of, of Africa country as well as energy needs. As we continue the conversation here at the COP, uh, COP26 uh, on uh, keeping emission below 1.5 degrees Celsius, it is ironic 
that small island developing uh, states and many African countries, despite being the least responsible for climate change and having least resources, are showing more leadership by ramping up our ambition. And uh, this one I can share with you, some of our government are investing 2% to tackle issues of, um, of uh, disasters, of uh, hazard that we are having in the, in the, on the continent. We just had about two, day, two years ago, the Aidai uh, cyclone that devastated Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. And we didn't get any support from any partners, from any, any fund, climate fund, but our government were able to take 2% of their own uh, national expenditure to address these issues to save life and save livelihood in Africa. So we are really very concerned about uh, this uh, spending that we are spending because 2% in our uh, budget, we can build roads, schools, and better hospitals for our communities because we are not responsible for the climate change uh, uh, emission. The green and blue economy provides a strong opportunity to embed technology into Africa's development trajectory. While uh, creating jobs, we need a lot of jobs because we don't want our youth to go and die in Mediterranean. We need jobs for this youth. We, want, we need to develop, we need to keep them you know, back home for, and uh, have a good livelihood instead of them to go to the terrorism groups like uh, Boko Haram, Al Shabaab, all this terrorism. It is insecurity and development you know, cannot be achieved as, you know, when we have insecurity on the continent. Early today, it was a great pleasure that uh, I haven't presented. After this mission, I will present my Green Recovery Action Plan because after COVID, this department was able to put in place an initiative that we are calling it the African Union Green Initiative Plan. And this plan will just be presented just after this, uh, this side event because we really want to recover our economy after the pandemic consequences. And this has five pillars, and these five pillars are what we, all, we are all talking about here. You know, we are mobilizing resources, financial investment in the sector. Second, energy, uh, renewable energies, but we want just transition, uh, uh, just transition uh, type of uh, energy renewable. We also looking at uh, the nature-based nature -based solution, which is very important, our forest, our water sources. So we want to address it as a recovery plan for the continent. And we also looking at uh, uh, issues uh, re related to uh, agric uh, resilient agriculture. And lastly, the green cities on the continent. So those are the real ambitious plan that uh, we put in place to really address the issue of um, climate, uh, the, the consequences of the pandemic. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, Africa must be empowered to develop its own technology rather than relying on obsolete technology transfer mechanism which only reinforce industry in global north as opposed to supporting green and blue economy that are able to adapt to climate change in uh, Africa's spe uh, specific context. We want really an innovation that ha can have a local context because at times we see that some machines come to Africa and we don't even know how to operate it and they become like a white elephant in our offices but we don't even have experts that can manage it when in terms of failure of those machines or this technology. So we really want a local context, you know, type of approach in this technology so that we leave no one behind. I thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, once again, I would like to really encourage your participation and attention to this event, which essentially will present findings from the technology needs assessment in the energy sectors for Africa. So in her opening remarks, Her Excellency, the Commissioner for Agriculture mentioned um, technology, a just transition, the need for energy and agriculture um, being responsive to climate change. So without further ado, um, I would like to invite um, 
our next set of panelists. So the first would be Ms. Sarah Trirup. Um, um, I would, I apologize if, <laughs> yes, okay, my apologies. So I would also like to invite for an opening statement, Dr. Chris Kiptu, the Principal Secretary uh, at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry of Kenya. Uh, Madam Commissioner, the representatives of the UNEP DTU and the Stockholm Institute, I bring greetings from Kenya. Jumbo. Let me first start by uh, congratulating the AUC, the Stockholm Institute, and the DTU for convening this side event, uh, which is focused on climate resilience. Mm -hmm. And Madam Commissioner has actually spoken on a number of issues I was going to talk, so I'll be very brief so that we can listen to the uh, panelists. Just to say that we, we have, as a country, we have developed the, what we call the Kenya Green economy strategy and implementation plan, which goes from the 2016 to 2030. This is also in addition to our adaptation plan or adaptation strategy that also goes up to 2030. We have several policies and even a law in, on climate change. And uh, we have done a lot on the policy space. I also want to say that um, this, will, the, this strategy will guide our country towards a low carbon resource efficient and, and uh, inclusive socioeconomic transformation of our country. We have been also at the forefront in advancing the Blue Economy Agenda. Mm -hmm. Some of you will recall we hosted the, the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in Nairobi in 2018. And one of the trigger effects of uh, the 2018 conference was the development and the advancement of the Africa Blue Economy Strategy developed by the African Union, which uh, Madam uh, referred to. Technology and finance do continue to remain primary challenges to the realization of the sustainable green and blue economy in Africa. Kenya appreciates the uh, support provided by Nordic countries, especially Sweden and Norway, that have supported the implementation of our climate and blue economy agenda, respectively. So I would like to encourage that this partnership continues and be deepened. Lastly, let me mention that Kenya has just launched the a two billion tree campaign. We launched it last uh, when we were here. We want to do two billion trees, grow tree, two billion trees by the end of next year, 2022, to take us to our threshold of 10% tree cover. So this will help us to support the ecosystem restoration. And we want to do this for the next 10 years. And I invite all of you to support us in this endeavor. Otherwise, uh, I want to thank you and uh, hope that these partnerships and the collaborations shall continue to flourish for the betterment, betterment of our collective humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. And we will, of course, be sure to support you in all these important endeavors. The continent really depends on them. So now we will move to the second part of this session, which is the presentation of the findings of the technology needs assessment. Often in conversations, we usually ask for finance and technology transfer. But then the next question is, what technology specifically do we want transferred and how? So this is where I would like to invite uh, Ms. Sarah Trerup and um, Mr. Mbeo Ogea um, to present their findings. Without further, further ado, please, the floor is... Okay. I shall move. I'll use this one. Can you hear me now? OK. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who has joined us here today. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm from UNEP DTU Partnership. And what I would really like to share with you here today is the, some insights in what we call the technology needs assessments. And this is a process under the Climate Convention where we have supported close to 100 countries uh, during the last more than 10 years in articulating their technology needs, both for adaptation and mitigation, and to report this through the UNFCCC and feeding into the negotiations here. And why is this important? Well, we, we work with national teams, it's country-driven processes, and 
they go through uh, what are the most appropriate technologies for both mitigation and adaptation within the specific context of their country. So they identify, prioritize technologies and go to a further analysis of what are the challenges and enabling frameworks required for further diffusion and upscale of these technologies. Then they develop the so-called technology action plans. Those are plans that lead the way forward for implementation and further diffusion within their specific context. And we will also hear, uh, we have a representative from the TNA in Liberia who will share more experiences with us later on. It's a process funded by the Global Environment Facility and it is also, uh, as I said, taking place here in the linkages between the financial mechanism and the technology mechanisms of the convention. So it's a highly uh, established process and I'm sharing with you here some insights from the African region. This is uh, how far we have covered countries um, by now, where we have 31 uh, countries where we can actually assess the data and present what are their technology needs. We work with regional centers, we work with University of Cape Town in Africa and we also work with Energy, in, Inda Energy in Senegal. We provide training to the national teams and support them in the process of articulating the technology needs. Hence, this is a process and outputs are not prepared by us, but it's prepared by countries with the support from our side and from our regional partners. <clears throat> so this is an overview of the sectors countries prioritize. And you can see here on the top, those are the sectors uh, for mitigation and on the bottom it's for adaptation. So out of the 31 countries, 30 countries have prioritized the energy sector, which is not a big surprise. Then we have LULUCF, forestry, waste management and transport. Those are for mitigation. For adaptation, most focus on water and agricultural sectors. So just to give you also some background, countries focus on two sectors for each mitigation and adaptation. And this is how uh, these results have come out. So zooming in on, on the energy sector and what priorities countries put forward and reporting under the convention of where their main technology needs lies. And you can see here for the energy sector, solar energy, hydropower, bioenergy, and then also a number of energy efficient technologies. And it's also important for me to say that it's not only a prioritization process based on what is only most important, but it's also reflecting where do they see the largest need for further enhancing the upscale and diffusion. So this also means that it's not only the key priority technologies, but also reflects where is the gap for further support. Then in the assessment of, we call it the ecosystems or the enabling frameworks for what's actually needed to upscale, to transfer and to further enhance the use of the technologies. And this is a, a, an overview of the data we have assessed on these enabling frameworks. And it comes out quite clear that, so the blue ones reflect for mitigation and the green ones for adaptation. So those are the, the challenges and where there's a need for enhancing the enabling conditions for the technology transfer. So it comes out quite clearly that economic and financial are the largest challenges. We have legal and regulatory, information awareness, human skills, technical issues. So it's just to give you a broad overview and there's much more details in the reports for each of the countries participating available. So in the interest of time, I'll just stop here. We have a website where all the information is available, all the reports are accessible, and it also includes contact details of what we call the National TNA Technology Needs Assessment Coordinators in each of the countries. So each country has a sub website uh, with more detailed information and we're also always happy to interact and, and convey uh, context to the country. So I'll stop here and pass the word on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and I believe our next speaker, um, Mr. Mbeyo, will be joining us from, um, well, online. So please bear with us if there's a small lag as we are trying to plug him in um, virtually.
Hello. Hello, Can you good hear afternoon, me? Uh, Mr. Mbeo. So, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mbeo Ogea. I work for the Stockholm Environment Institute. And I'll be presenting in brief one of the projects that we did in uh, uh, small islands that the Union of Comoros, together with my colleagues, Stella Bennington and Rocio Diaz Chavez. So, the UN Economic Commission for Africa Sub Region uh, Office funded this project. And the main reason was to develop energy balance statistics, develop uh, scenario analysis on the basis of energy strategy and conducting capacity development to support energy balance development. Uh, the country is uh, a very small country with barely a million population. It's a fishing community but also engage in subsistence agriculture. The main agricultural exports include vanilla, cloth, ylang lang essential oil, and uh, the residents depend a lot on remittances. We used uh, LIP tool, which is a tool that's developed in uh, uh, SCI, to build the energy balance statistics. The total energy demand is uh, just about 6,000 terajoules. And mostly it's derived from biomass fuel and oil products. Electricity only constitutes about 2% of the total energy uh, mix. We, the island comprises of three main islands. And if you look at the, the trends in the island, still biomass dominates in the island of Gazija, Anjuani, and Moeli. And uh, the main sectors are residential sectors. Um, uh, the cottage industries, that's the uh, essential oil distilleries, especially in Anjuani, and also in uh, domestic fishing, that is uh, 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 is one of the livelihoods. That shows the importance of the ocean to eat. The country uh, really has so much challenge in terms of energy. And compared to the Sadek community, its tariff is one uh, electricity tariff is one US dollar per kilowatt hour, heavily subsidized by the government. And this puts a tariff burden of over a thousand different tariff burden between the island with the Union of Como, uh, uh, with the SADC region average. Uh, however, establishing or building their energy systems balance is very important to them for future uh, uh, financing and also uh, for um, upscaling and planning their energy systems. Basically, besides the biomass, most other energy is imported. And the main dominant use for it is uh, in the residential sector. And this begs the challenge of how do they build their economy? The country has established its own need for renewable energy seeking to expand its renewable electricity scope by 55%. The reason is because of the challenges of um, energy security, in which uh, uh, most high tides, the country cannot access imported fuels from uh, uh, Middle East because of uh, the harsh weather condition. And for months or few days or couple of weeks, the country will be in dire uh, uh, in continuous blackout, which also impacts so much on their social and economic well-being. Ideally, the country has quite an interesting plan to stabilize its electricity sources. And in uh, our assessment, we had three sets of recommendations that based on the 27th energy balance statistics developed at the island at the national level, subsequent updates of this energy balance statistics need to be done guided by international energy agency guidelines. And this will support future planning and better uh, uh, support for the economic development of the country. And to strengthen the energy planning unit within the Directorate General of Energy Mines and Water Resources, collecting and organizing energy sector data and to implement the national energy systems model to respond to sector policy and planning requirements. And finally, to support institutionalization of the annual production 
of the national energy uh, balance statistics for reporting for uh, the Directorate General of uh, Energy Mines and Water Resources. So there's so much that uh, is happening in the country and several analysis that uh, uh, took place, especially in the productive uses of energy and the need for energy security in this small island. Uh, on the screen is Ilang Lang plant, which works well and uh, forms one of the basic economic building blocks for the country. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so because time is very limited, we are rushing ahead with um, the panel session. So thank you to the presenters and thank you to uh, the commissioner and um, to the principal secretary who made their opening remarks. So without further ado now, I shall hand over the floor to um, Philip Osano, who's the director um, for Africa at the Stockholm Environment Institute, who will guide us through a panel session that will bring together the voices of uh, young people, um, scientists, and this will be an interactive panel. So thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Philip. Thank you, Marco. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, we have 30 minutes, and I want to try and make it very exciting. Thank you, Mbeo, uh, for joining. Uh, may I request uh, Christopher Kaba, uh, please join, uh, join us on the stage. Uh, may I request uh, Christopher uh, Bo Botzo, Botzo, I hope I got it right. Uh, and may I request uh, Kenza Ben Musa uh, to, to join us on the stage. Where can I sit? Can I worry? <laughs> Good. Feel free to, it's free, free fall. Um, Kenza? Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've, you've, you've had the commissioner set the context, uh, you had the principal secretary. Uh, say what's happening at the national level. Um, uh, I want to start with you, uh, Christopher Kaba. Uh, you are the TNA coordinator for Liberia. Uh, what, what two things uh, strike you and what message would you like uh, to convey to your listeners regarding um, the context in which has been set on blue and green economy uh, in Liberia? Thank you so much. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, one of the things that I would like to say that really struck me the most is the TNA process. Uh, early on, when we started the TNA process in the country, a lot of people in uh, Liberia did not even understand what technology is. Whenever we make, we make mentions of technology to address climate, uh, uh, to, to, to solve climate uh, problems, they normally, you know, uh, regard it as a technology like cell phones or computer that you'll be able to use to solve certain problems. We have to systematically, you know, sit with them and discuss with them, make them to understand that this is a solution that is intended to address problems that are confronting you, that is caused by climate change. And uh, what really amazed me much, much about the TNA process is the kinds of stakeholder consultation. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started getting people involved in the process, they started to, you know, to suggest technologies that we could not even imagine of. We, we, when we started, we started by identifying technologies that we think we could take to them for them to be able to prioritize. Uh, during the prioritization process, they started to even suggest more technologies to us. So that, that shows that the people, uh, the indigenous people, people that live in these uh, areas that you know, are affected by you know, climate change, really know solutions that will be able to address you know, the climate uh, problems that we have in the country. So that is one of the things that amazed me a lot about the TNA process. That I would like to say the stakeholder consultation, the people, they were very robust. They got involved. The indigenous people, they were willing you know, to contribute towards the process, and everybody collectively got involved, and they told us what, what is required for the country and where we need to, you know, to prioritize the process. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Christopher. I mean, I hear from you two things. One, the process itself was very consultative, and that allowed you, besides other technologies which are um, 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 from outside, also to tap into the indigenous local technologies from, uh, from, from, from uh, local people. Um, 
Christoph, if you listen to this, Denmark has a lot of rich experience, uh, I guess particularly in the energy sector, uh, and you've made a lot of progress. Um, if you think about um, what you're talking about in the green economy and blue economy, do you have some examples that could be relevant in terms of the experience Denmark has gone through that can be relevant to the African context? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, you know, in, in Denmark, we, we started the, the green transition after the oil crisis in the 1970s. And today we have uh, more than half of our energy productions come from wind, uh, electricity productions come from wind energy. And uh, even though we have uh, so much reliable energy in our energy system, we are still number one in Europe when it comes to security of supply. Mm. And it's payable for the Danish consumers. So it, it actually shows that uh, the green technologies are, uh, are there if you want to establish new energy capacity, new electricity capacity. Uh, wind and solar is the cheapest one, uh, if you look at uh, per megawatt. Um, and this has taken, uh, th this, is, this is a, a real important uh, argument for the green transition that it's uh, doable and it's payable uh, for all of us. And I do know that the conditions in Denmark are not the same as they are in uh, as the African continent. I visit uh, South Africa this October, um, went to the Mpumalanga region, just next to Johannesburg, and uh, just a half an hour drive in a car, I uh, watched five or six enormous coal-fired power plants, and only two of them could produce enough energy for Denmark for a year. Mm. And you have coal in your backyard. You have uh, one third of the people in the region uh, that it's unemployed, and most of the employed people are in the coal business. So that underlined for me the, um, the importance of a just transition that without a just transition, we will have no transition. And um, I, I think that's where the, um, the experience from Denmark can also uh, come into the picture, because uh, in Denmark, we have seen that the green transition comes with a lot of jobs at the same time. Uh, for example, uh, offshore wind, one gigawatt offshore wind, creates 14,000 man-year jobs. You cannot have offshore wind in Mpumalanga because it's in the middle of South Africa. But you can have other kinds of renewable energy. And I, I think we, we need to, to think the green transition as um, needed for the climate but also needed for the population and creating jobs at the same time. And that's actually what, what we have been doing in Denmark for uh, last four years. So, so, I mean, the commissioner talked about just transition, and I think you're talking about the potential. I mean, it's so amazing to hear the experience that Denmark has gone through. Uh, we'll come back to that conversation, but I think one of the concrete things we want to come up with from here is actually where, where those kind of examples can motivate action uh, and what else needs to be done? I mean, uh, the PS here for Kenya talked about having already a framework, but how do you translate framework into now uh, real tangible investment into, you know, you talked about wind, 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 wind energy, for example, so I'm, I'm, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, but talking about just transition and employment, um, I, I would like to get to you, Kenza. Uh, you are a young professional, you are, you are a young climate negotiator, you are doing your PhD. Um, what, what does it, what, what's the space, where's the space for young people uh, in all this conversation? And, and for Africa, we know uh, the, the demographic bulge is, is quite huge. A lot of young people need employment. Uh, is there a space for them? What, what, what do you take of this, given your experience in the negotiation process and, and listening to all this? Yeah, first, thanks for having me here. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, good. Can you hear? Good. Yeah. So, um, First of all, I consider myself as a citizen of the world, but first, I'm African with, by heart and blood. 
And it is so sad to see the actual situation in Africa. It is hard hit by the COVID-19 crisis, mm. but also it's vulnerable by the climate change. And um, this is the, the this situation have bad results about the employment of young people and young Africans. So this situation can be changed if actions are being taken now and not tomorrow. And the good news is there is a way of recovery. Mm. It, and the, the good news, the news of recovery, is the, the green recovery is possible mm. thanks to that. So talking, uh, I will be talking about on behalf of young African people, uh, there is a crisis uh, of employment due to the COVID-19 crisis and or what I have been said before. And those people need some solutions, some concrete solutions. They need to be rethink, we need to rethink about how to integrate them for the employment, creating some opportunities for them, but also building their capacities. So uh, as we see here in the COP26, we talk a lot about building capacities for young people. And this is something so important, especially for young people and women who have lost their jobs, and they, they need this kind of, 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 um, of skills and they need also financial support mm -hmm. to co-create uh, eco-innovative solutions to tackle the climate crisis and so on. Yeah, so we had it, uh, women, youth, employment, uh, recovery, green recovery. The commissioner talked about that. Um, um, I, I wonder, I mean, I, I just also want to go to the audience and I hope this is possible. I wonder if there's anyone with a burning question or issue that you'd like to, um, to we have about five minutes, five to ten minutes. Um, is there anybody with an issue or question that you want to sort of bring up to the panel? O okay, I will only take two. Um, and, and one has to be a man and one has to be a lady. So because there's no lady, allow me the prerogative to take two men. Is that okay? Okay, sir, tell us your name um, and, 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 and your question. And, and please be very brief. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ibukuma Dewumi. I'm from Nigeria, and I work for the Global Ocean Account Partnership in Australia. Uh, the blue economy is, is important for Africa, and of course, uh, the blue economy also needs to be adaptive, uh, adaptive and uh, for, hoi, for it to be able to mitigate uh, the impact of climate change. But we do have some high-level documents prepared by the African Union. One uh, is the African Integrated Maritime Strategy, 2050, and the African Blue Economy Strategy. Uh, how do we ensure that uh, political buy-in for the blue economy is achieved through these uh, various high-level documents? And secondly, uh, the blue economy itself uh, seems to be uh, misunderstood in Africa. We don't have uh, the African Union definition of the blue economy. And this has been making it uh, difficult for countries in the region to also have like a derivative of that. Some would say the uh, World Bank definition of the blue economy is the way to go. Some would say it's the OECD. Some would say it's the one by... But, so, but we don't have exactly we don't know what the blue economy means for Africa, and uh, that's my question to the panel next time. Okay, I hope you heard. I think the first question is very clear. How do you get political buy-in for blue economy to implement practical measures? I think I'll skip that question, the second one on, on terminologies and definition. I know it's very important, uh, but it shouldn't stop us from taking action, which is exactly what you're interested in. Yeah, so your name and uh, quick question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate for this uh, presentation. I'm Cassius Clay from Timor-Leste. Uh, for the time being, uh, in Timor-Leste, we are uh, producer of the power plant from the fossil fuel. So I just want to learn from your side that how can we adopt the green and the blue economy so to create a job for the young people in, in Timor-Leste? Because, because the, uh, uh, the, less of the, the less of the working place is uh, one of the social issues happening in Timor-Leste. How can we promote the we promote the renewable energy so can can facilitate the job creation in Timor-Leste. 
Th thank you very much. Wow, thank you. So the lessons are going all the way to Timo Leste. Uh, so back to the panelists, you had the questions. Uh, one is how can we get the political buy-in for the blue economy in Africa to operationalize it in terms of concrete action. The second is the experience from Timo Leste and whether there could be any examples you can share that's relevant. So what I'll do is I'll give each of you uh, uh, two minutes, uh, or one and a half minutes. If you have a question to answer, you can answer and then give you a closing statement. So I'll go back the other way around. So uh, I'll start with you, uh, Kenza. Can you please repeat the question? So there are two questions. The first one is we have a blue economy framework uh, strategy and African maritime strategy, high level document. Uh, but the question is how do we get political buy-in for this uh, high level document at the national level to lead to implementation on the ground. Uh, the second question was about transition also to renewable energy, and uh, East Timor Leste is going through the same process. What lessons can, can we have for them? Okay, so I will be first answering for the first question. Um, it reminds me of a quote that I heard in the COP25 by some indigenous people. They said, uh, if you are not around the table of negotiation, you will be part of the menu. Mm. So you impose yourself as a young people. You try to be in inside your delegation, express what, what, what you want to see, fight for that, and try to be inside the table of, of negotiation and like just uh, talk about this subject. So this is for this one. Uh, the second one, I will just pass. Sorry. Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, thank you. If you're not part of the table, you'll be part of the menu. That's nice. <laughs> thank you, Christoph. Um, to, to the second question about uh, which kind of uh, lessons learned can yeah. we share? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in Denmark, we have 14 years of experience. Uh, we have a lot of do's and especially don'ts. So uh, I think if, if you look up internationally, you will have a lot of lessons learned. Then uh, if you mix them, hopefully they will uh, f f fit in to, uh, to your situation. And somehow you also need to, to think in, in new ways and develop something yourself. At the moment, we are looking at uh, power to x carbon capture and storage, because I think that's the, the second half of the green transition, mm -hmm. especially in Northern Europe. Uh, so, so, so at the moment, we, we try to develop new technologies, new ways of doing it. But, but we, we also look abroad, uh, try to be inspired. And, and I think if, if we can mix these two things together, the, the lessons learned and some of the new technologies, mm -hmm. we can um, we actually have the possibility of reaching our 2050 targets. Very, very motivating and encouraging. Um, thank you so much. We'll follow up with you on how to do that. Uh, Christopher, you have, you have the last word. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, with the second question, I would say that uh, we do not have a concrete example in my country in Liberia to give. Yeah. So I would not want to tap in uh, responding to that, but I would like to uh, answer the first question. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have a very good example of how to carry out uh, these kind of processes and, you know, uh, having political buy-in. Uh, take, for example, our country, the president of our country is a young person, and seeing his ascendancy, a lot has been going on in the country in terms of, you know, uh, 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 getting involved into climate-related activities in my country. Uh, the Paris Agreement was ratified, mm. and uh, recently the, 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 the NDC revision process, he was part of it, and he has been very supportive. So uh, the easiest way to do it in my country is, is just to have a roundtable discussions and bring that to the to the policymaker attentions probably much has not been done by we the technicians are supposed to uh, carry out the required informations out so that we'll get them involved 
-hmm. I feel that once we get them involved and they know exactly the the relevance of you know blue economy and uh, the intent of having uh, the development of our country being green development, they will definitely you know get involved and they will have the kind of you know buy-in that they want to have. So I don't think it will be a challenge for my country. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking for Liberia. You know, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a problem. Uh, uh, you could still uh, maybe search on the internet, you'll realize that uh, three months ago, we had a national climate change conference, mm -hmm. and the president was involved into that. All of, this, all of the stakeholders, the policy makers, the, the ministers, they were all there present, and we allowed them to commit themselves into the fight against climate change. So anything that is involved into with climate change, our, our leaders, our policy makers are really willing to also support such an initiative. So it's something that, you know, moving from, you know, Glasgow, we hope to carry out information of such and also get them closely, you know, informed and bring, address them to issues of such. Yeah, thank you. Just, just very quickly, I, all of you talk great things about public policy, about citizens' engagement, youth and, and, and women and so on. But I didn't hear about private sector. Does any of you have a very quick, you know, because you know the private sector is the engine of a lot of this kind of thing, particularly innovation and technology. A uh, quick one? Yeah, so nowadays I think that here in the COP it's not about uh, stakeholders or parties getting together to discuss about the Paris Agreement. It's also many things happening around, which is private sectors also gathering and trying to find some solutions and going green. Mm. So I will just share an experience um, recently uh, with uh, the World Economic Forum. We, we had a meeting with uh, the, some CEOs. Mm -hmm to discuss about some solutions together to tackle climate crisis. And we had some feedback from the CEOs. They told us that whatever, in, when it, anything they want to do to improve themselves, they, they have been facing some uh, challenges from people saying, oh, we are just trying to greenwash us. Mm -hmm. So this is also an issue to talk about. I think to tackle the climate crisis, we all have a responsibility as a party, as private sectors, by companies, also activists. So we are all part of this ocean and we need to join our efforts to, to, to fight against one problem for all of us. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think that brings us to this part of the session. It's been very exciting, but like any music, it has to come to a stop at some point. May I request you to just give a round of applause to our distinguished panelists? Um, and then it will be my thank you so much. Feel free to um, uh, step out. It's now my uh, pleasure to invite uh, Susan Pedersen, the director of UNEP DTU, uh, to give the closing remarks. Uh, so, Susan, uh, over to you. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very uh, interesting panel and uh, with very different and very good perspectives on the green transition. And as my colleague uh, Sarah told uh, everyone, we have uh, looked at the technology needs assessments in about 100 countries already. And we do believe that there are uh, very good technologies out there where we can also leapfrog uh, the development to a low carbon transition in Africa. Notably, uh, the uh, market prices in uh, solar and wind power and other uh, areas of technology have really dropped uh, dramatically and been deployed uh, large scale uh, everywhere. But I think what we've also learned, and it was also mentioned at the panel here today, is uh, a just transition is also very important and technology transfer also means uh, actually local anchoring, local production, training and upgrading, and making sure that uh, the countries of Africa can also both operate and, and uh, receive uh, the, the technologies. Uh, we do see examples certainly in Africa where solar power is being deployed, but mostly by international companies without maybe sufficient uh, transfer. So this brings me to the concluding point is that uh, whenever we identify uh, opportunities for green transition, we need to look at the multiple benefits. We need to look at how do you best deploy technologies and also try to ensure 
that it does benefit those that are most, uh, let's say, underrepresented, and uh, that includes uh, very many different, uh, let's say, um, uh, groups. It could be women, youth, gender, underrepresented groups, uh, etc. And then we also uh, uh, need to uh, learn uh, from uh, where do we get the, the best uh, multiple benefits and evaluate those things as well. And this panel today has certainly shown that uh, learning from each other, uh, having a dialogue and learning from everyone else's experience is one way forward. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.